Welcome to the Newton tutorial series. I'm Mike Cruz with AC Tech and in this tutorial I'm just going to give you a quick overview of some of the data that's contained in this CSV file that gets spit out when you're running a simulation. So right off the bat I'm going to tell you that the majority of our users will never use the CSV file. They'll never look inside it. They never need to do anything with it. You don't even really need the file. It has two functions. It serves as to kind of create a backup hard copy of some of the data that you ran with the simulation, some of the input file data, and it also has some basic time step data that's basically the same data that's in the, the uncompressed file. Although, of course, there's only a tiny fraction amount of data compared to what's in the, the UCM file. The second function of this is that AC Tech might use it as a debugging tool. So if you send us an email and say, hey, my simulation will not run, it's crashing, or it won't do this, or it won't do that, chances are we're going to come back to you and we're going to say, okay, can you please email me the input file and the CSV file from that simulation, and I'll try and figure out what's going on. So outside of those two, um, outside of those two functions, it has no other function. And if you're not interested in what's inside it because you don't really need to know, then just go ahead and skip to the next tutorial because I'm just going to talk for the next 10 minutes about some of the things that are in here. So if you are interested, let's go ahead up to the top and basically the, the CSV file has two main components. The, the top half or so of the file contains basic simulation parameters, some initial simulation settings, just some basic stuff that was used when you set up the simulation. The second half of the CSV file contains um, uh, some time step data, some basic parameters from every time step, from every frame that was printed to the UCM file. So looking at the top, we've got basic computer information, computer name, operating system, processor. Uh, we have a few input variables from Newton. We say, okay, well, here's my simulation time. Uh, here's my liquid bridge data, the same stuff that's here. Uh, ratchet spring data, whether I'm using ratchet effect. Uh, gravity, we used to give you the option to set your X, Y, and Z gravity, but now we've just removed that feature. It's just always 9.81 in the Z direction. The Some other time step variables. So, you know, we've got our... our lambda, this is our particle overlap, critical time ratio, the max expected velocity, use variable time step, you know, how many threads, and the critical time as, as well as the initial time step that were used since this was a variable time step. Then we have our output draw time, and after some of that basic data, we have a series of tables, a series of arrays. So basically, if I go through, these are, there are 15 different sphere types, 15 different clusters that we used in this simulation. And each of those clusters has an internal friction coefficient. And if I go to my friction settings, I only set up one set of material properties, only just this one. So every cluster in the simulation has the same coefficient of internal friction. So if I was to compare cluster 3, if I had contact between cluster 3 and cluster 11, or cluster 2 and cluster 1, this is the friction matrix that governs that contact. But certainly all the values are 0.65 because that's the only value we have. If I go to the next table, we have a damping coefficient matrix, and that is based on our coefficient of restitution. It's used for when we bounce the spheres off of each other. Below that, there's a, there's a material rolling matrix, which is created based on our rotational damping. Then there's a ratchet matrix, which is created based on our ratchet effect. Uh, we have a surface coefficient of friction matrix. So now, after the, the sphere things, we have some of, these surface, uh, some of the surface arrays as well. So you can tell, here are the layers that we had, and here are those same 15 sphere types. So contact between you know backplate and sphere one has a 0.6 friction coefficient. Um, over here you can see that our feeder belt had a lower coefficient, and the feeder box had a lower coefficient as well. But the fact that all of these are 0.6 means that you know I set 0.6 here, and over in my DXF layers I did not go and and override any of those surface frictions. They're all I left them all at the default my damping coefficient matrix, again that's based on our coefficient of restitution, uh, coefficient of rolling rolling against the surface, your ratchet matrix regarding the surface, and then after those arrays we have some sphere properties. So these are, we used 15 different types of spheres 
in the in the simulation. So we had we happened to have 15 clusters as well, but between those 15 clusters, there were a total of 15 different differently sized spheres. And for each of those spheres, here's the radius, here's the mass, the group number for the cluster it was attached to, and the number of spheres in the cluster that this sphere belonged to. So right below that sphere data, we have the data about each specific cluster. So if I wanted to, I could say, well, group one, the first cluster, if I look at my material generation, this was the set I used. So let's go over to that set. And I can see group one, 12 spheres, 12 spheres there. So this is the, we're just looking at the clusters in order that they're listed right here in the library. So what do I got? I've got the number of spheres, I've got the mass of the cluster, the density of the cluster, the volume of the cluster, and the max dimension. So that max dimension is exactly what I put right here, 0 0.25, 250 millime millimeters. Uh, I have my moment of inertia about the x, y, and z axes, and I also have a list of each of the 12 spheres that are in that cluster and how they are uh, and, and where they are positioned. So if I wanted, I, I could go over to my cluster. I go to this. Um, let's see, what was this? This was a three by two by two by 15, right? I'm already on it. 3 by 2 by 2 by 15. Okay, so if I look at this and I say, well, looking at these properties, my volume is uh, something, something, something 4594. But if I look over here, it's something, something 2903. So there's a different volume. And you say, well, why is that? And that's because the, all these parameters correspond to this cluster right here. And this cluster has sphere radius of 100. So this cluster is much bigger. When we actually imported that cluster to our particle set, we scaled it. So our actual sphere radius for the particle that we used in the simulation, the sphere radius is 39.8, not 100. So these values are necessarily different from these values. So we go through these. We have groups, group 1, 2, 3, 4, 8, 10, 12, down to 15. Oh, what was, what was group 15? It was a generated group. It was a single sphere with cluster size 70 millimeters. You can see right there, one sphere, there's my 70 millimeters, and my one single sphere data. So after the cluster data, we have some basic triangle type data. The triangle type data, that's, the triangle type is just another word for the different layers. So we have nine triangle types, and here's the layer, the, here's the name for each of those layers, for each of those triangle types. We've got the number of triangles that were in each type, and in our complete list of triangles for the whole simulation, we have the starting and ending index for the triangle. Uh, next to that, we have a friction factor. This should not actually be friction factor. I think this is supposed to be a liquid bridge multiplier. I think that's what that should be. Um, just a misprint there. What do we have? We have velocity changes. So for each of these layers, does the velocity change on that layer? Or is it always constant? And then it's all set to false. So some of these layers have velocities, but none of the velocities ever change for any of the layers. Uh, what do we have? We have velocity restart time, velocity start, velocity excel, velocity restart excel. I think these are switched, these two right here. Because certainly our velocity start time is not 9 million. But you, even, you might even look at this and say, well, where is this 9 million, where is this 1 million coming from? So if I go to here and I say, it's all a bunch of zeros, it's all a bunch of blanks. And the point is that the velocity stop time, there is no velocity stop time. But Newton requires that a stop time is input. So if you leave this value blank right here, if you leave that blank, Newton will just stick a value of 1 million in there. Because then, you know, no one's ever going to run a simulation out to 1 million seconds. You, would, it, you, just, you can't get there. So next to that, we have, um, does it have a velocity? If it has a velocity, well, let's go ahead and print out what is that velocity. The max total velocity, the velocity in the x, the velocity in the y, the velocity in the z. And next to that, does it have movement? Did we set up any sort of um, linear or rotational movement? If so, what were my move velocities? What was my rotation rate and my rotation axis? So just some basic triangle layer data. Below that, we have a couple of complicated arrays that I'm not going to explain. It's basically some force arrays for calculating our liquid bridge forces. And then finally, below that, we finally get to the time step data. So everything above this time step data, this was all printed out in, in a single instant when we started the simulation.
And now the, after we start the simulation, every time we print a file to the UCM file, we're also going to print um, we're also going to print another line to this data file. Whoops, don't want to do that. Cancel. So the time step data that we output is well simulation time 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04. Total runtime in minutes. You can see that if I go to the bottom, we ran this simulation for 4.75 minutes during that last tutorial when I was um, when I was discussing running a simulation. Uh, the total runtime in hours, the simulation time over the runtime, the simulation time, a couple of ratios. These are just a couple of ratios that can help you gauge the efficiency of your simulation relative to other simulations. Um, estimated time to completion, how long do we have left? That's that same value that's printed in the top left corner. So when you're running the simulation, it says the estimated time to completion is, and then that's this identical value. Total created mass. Well, as I generate my particles, as I generate particles, I'm creating mass in the simulation. So every, you know, every, what is this, every 0.23 seconds or so, we generate another layer of material. So this is the total mass that we have generated so far. And right next to that is the mass per second that we created. And you can see a bunch of zeros here. That's because we created a single layer in one single instant. So that means that we created 62 kilograms in 0.01 seconds. So you take 62 divided by 0.01, you get 6200. Total destroyed mass. So when these particles leave the simulation, either by a, a kill box or when they just exit the bounds of the simulation, they're destroyed. And we keep a running total of how much mass we destroyed. So if I go to the bottom of this list, you can see that we had started to kill some of the particles. Some of the particles had started to leave the simulation by the time we stopped the simulation. Next to that, we have the current number of clusters that are in the simulation and the total number of clusters that we generated for, for the simulation so far. So certainly, once we reach steady state, the current number of clusters will remain relatively constant, but the total clusters generated is going to keep on going up because we keep on generating more material. Same with the current number of spheres. Certainly, that's the, total, the current number of spheres is just how many spheres are in each cluster currently and, and how many of those are in the simulation. The total destroyed mass in the box, these are for the kill boxes. So when we destroy mass using the kill boxes, it's just a kind of a total of, of that information. Now besides that, the data at all the rest of the data, the rest of these, you know, couple hundred columns, is just force data for each layer. So all it's doing is for each layer it's printing out some basic, you know, elastic, viscous, uh, and some other forces for each of the layers. And again, the force data the, the elastic and the viscous force you're not usually interested in. However, if you recall from one of the geometry tutorials, we talked about recording the parallel and perpendicular force on triangles. And in the post-processing tutorials, in, in, the, in, in a later tutorial, you'll also read about, you'll, you'll hear about how you actually view those forces. So those forces are also saved in this CSV file. However, in the playback file, in the UCM file, we save those forces for each single triangle. But in the CSV file, we don't do that. We only save the total force for the whole layer. Because again, this is just intended to be some, some, some extra data that we, that we have in a separate file just as a backup copy. So if I go over to that, you can see if I look at the receiving belt, and I look um, right, no, there, there it is right here. Receiving belt tangential parallel force and the tangential perpendicular force. So these two columns, the parallel and perpendicular forces, that's exactly what you would see if you open up this this playback file, which actually, you know, you can go ahead and do that. I'll show you that one more time. If I open up that playback file really quick, as soon as it opens. Now, we just say that my receiving belt, change that to force, and maybe we go to five seconds, oops, five seconds, six seconds, and play. So I talk, I talk in the other tutorials about looking at these, these forces. But if I go here and I say, show total layer force, this layer force that it's showing should be identical to the, to the data in this column right here. Similarly, when I switch to my um, parallel force, that force is going to be identical to the data in the parallel column. 
that total force. So before um, we just added these these um, this triangle forces feature, we just added this in a pretty recent version of Newton. Um, and so before doing that, some of our users might actually go and and try and copy these forces and create a graph. So if I wanted to tangential parallel and perpendicular. So let's go ahead and copy those right here. And now I go back over and copy my time column. Now if I want, I can say insert scatter chart, chart. And there are my layer forces. And obviously it's it's the data has quite a bit of scatter to it, but you can tell I've got my perpendicular and my parallel force. So that's the way you used to have to do it. But now because because we have added this ability to record and view these forces and to be able to view the total forces in the plotting window you no longer even need to look at this file there's there's really nothing in here that you can do anything with so after all the time step data if I go down to the very bottom the, the last three things we print are the total number of simulated spheres, total number of clusters and the simulation time which this data is actually exactly the same as this and this and that but we just print it out right at the end. So the point is that there's really not much data in here for you to do anything with. It's primarily just kind of a backup copy that AC Tech would use if you were having a problem with a simulation. So as I mentioned, if your simulations are running just fine and you and you don't want the file clutter, you could go ahead and delete that, but it's only one meg, so you might as well just leave it. But I think that covers everything regarding that CSV file. So if you have any questions about it, if you're really, really curious, I suppose you could send us an email um, at info at actech.com. But for the most part, it's not nothing to be concerned about. So, well, I think that covers everything. So then that's all. Thanks.